love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea wall. You are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence you won't let go. In the questions your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea wall. You are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you. Oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore. Thank you, Aman, and uh, praise man. Let's give them thanks this morning. We'll... Good morning. How is everyone on a rainy morning? Pray that uh, as the rain comes down from heaven, that the word of God will shower upon us in our hearts and lives, especially as we look forward to the great banquet that will be ours in Christ in heaven. Please notice in the eagle all of the uh, uh, meetings and uh, things that are happening uh, and uh, take them to heart and uh, participate and, uh, uh, as the body of Christ here at St. John's. Let's uh, begin with uh, the opening song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Fount of every blessing to 
see, never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me song, melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of the I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee prone to Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord saves. We are invited into his eternal kingdom. By faith we will accept the invitation. Let us pray. Almighty God, you invite us to trust in you for our salvation. We confess our sins Lord, of our pride, worry, and fear Lord, for running to others first instead of presenting our requests before you, Lord, for rejecting you when we should accept you, Lord, forgiveness, Lord, grace, Salvation through Jesus Christ is ours. Thank you, God. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading for today is taken from Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 to 9. On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined, and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. 
Our epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, uh, chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly now at length that you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In, ever, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. Let us stand for the hearing of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel of Matthew chapter 22, beginning at verse 1. And again Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. We join together in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May be seated for our sermon song. Incredible. 
Christ alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are stilled when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of christ i stand In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live Day up from the grave, he rose again, and as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. Thank you for your music. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today is our gospel reading from Matthew chapter 22. Indeed, Jesus gives us a parable about uh, a feast, a great uh, wedding, that uh, banquet that has been prepared something that you and I will look forward to someday in heaven. We bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking that you will renew and refresh us in the study of your word. Continue to mold and shape us and move us with your love that we might be living for you here on earth as we look to celebrate with you in heaven at that great wedding banquet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Fellow redeemed, in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, 
All throughout scripture, there is a theme that uh, talks about a great feast that will occur in heaven. It is a wedding feast given by God the Father for his son, Jesus, who is the bridegroom. The Apostle John tells us in the book of Revelation, For the wedding of the Lamb has come. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. I'd like you to take out your bulletin and turn it to our gospel reading for today. If you have a pen or pencil and would like to take notes, you are welcome to do so. Especially as I dissect, if you will, the parable this morning. The parable begins, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet. Who are those people that were invited first to the banquet? Well, first of all, God the Father sends out his invitation to his very own people, the Hebrew people, the people of God, all the way back in the Old Testament, the Jews who were still there in Jerusalem and the area. And what happened? Those people did not want to go to the feast. It's not surprising that they were like this because they were like this throughout the Old Testament. Uh, They rejected God and went their own way and then God would punish them and then God would come back to them and establish a covenant with them again with his love and mercy. But always pointing them to the coming Messiah. Over 300 Bible verses in the Old Testament testify to the fact that God would send a Savior. And as you read the Old Testament, you begin to understand that it becomes clearer and clearer as you read the Old Testament, as it progresses, you will see how the Savior is to come. Now these people had the Word of God. They had the wonderful invitation of the Father to come to the wedding feast, and yet they didn't come. But he sends his servants out a second time, and he wants them to come. And what was the result of that invitation? After he already said that the feast was already prepared, his oxen and his cattle had been butchered, and and the food had been prepared, and where are all of the guests? Now, we are told in our text that Some, or one, went out to his field. Must have been a farmer. And the other was a merchant and had to go do his business. And then we are told that the rest of the people treated the servants, uh, well, put it this way, they kind of messed them up. Even to the point of killing some of those servants. And they refused to go to the wedding banquet. When the king heard this, he was enraged. And we are told that he sent troops to destroy their city. Now some commentaries believe that that was done, completed in 70 AD with the destroying Jerusalem and the temple of God in 70 AD. You see, the Old Testament was known for killing its prophets, God's prophets, because they didn't want to obey and heed God's word. That's why the king is enraged. And he destroys that town and that temple. In our day, we are told that, that uh, 
Not unlike the people that went to the farm and to their business, they get so engrossed in the things of this world that, that they forget God. They forget to put God first in their lives. For one, his farming was the most important thing. In another, it was his business that was the most important thing. And so today, as we hear this parable, we have to ask ourselves, is God first in our lives? Or are we too engrossed in the things and the material things of this world? I dare say when we look in the mirror that we all stand guilty and we indeed fall short of not putting God first in our lives. And that is a a great problem that we have in our day. Because God doesn't reign supreme. Oh, we do put God someplace in our lives, but he's not the most important thing of our lives. Other things become our idols. In the Old Testament, they even had the audacity to put idols in the temple of God in Jerusalem. Can you imagine that? The true God in his temple has idols also placed there by his people to be worshipped. You and I also have our idols that we make as we dethrone God and don't put them first. And for that, we humbly ask our gracious God to forgive us. And the great goodness and love of God comes and takes away our sin and restores us to a proper relationship with his Father. As God's children, we hear, everything is ready, come to the wedding banquet. You see, worshiping God's house and receiving the Lord's Supper is only but a foretaste of the feast that is to come, that heavenly banquet. But like those in the parable who ignore the king's invitation, we often ignore our God. And as we do so and as we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and he will forgive our sins and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, after the king sends his army to destroy those wicked people and their city, he tells his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. The, second invita- the third invitation here that is given in this parable symbolizes the good news of the gospel for everyone in the world. We are told in Acts, Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in my name to all nations. And then in Matthew 28, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe or to obey everything that I have commanded you. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went into the streets, and they gathered all the people they could find, both bad and good. And that's the turning point in this parable. God the king invites both good and bad to the banquet. Now I ask you, if you had to interpret this parable, 
Who are the good and who are the bad? Or who are the bad and who are the good? You would probably think, well, the good are, are the people that obey the law of God and are near perfect. Then you would say the bad are those that are really bad sinners. And you'd be kind of right, but more wrong. The way one commentary put it, that the uh, good are like Joseph of Arimathea, who took the body of Jesus on Good Friday and buried him in his own tomb, one in which no one had ever been laid. In other words, Joseph of Arimathea was a Pharisee, but he was a secret follower of Christ, and he wanted to follow Christ. But in spite of all of the good things that he would do, he still was a sinner. Now the bad person would be compared to the thief on the cross. And he was put on the cross because he was a bad sinner. He must have committed some atrocity, a thief, whatever. But he also on the cross confessed Jesus. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You see, he heard the words of Jesus from the cross. And by the mighty working of the Spirit of God, he became a believer in Jesus. And Jesus says to him, Verily, verily, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So they invited the good and the bad. Everyone they could find. And the banquet hall was going to be filled. As the people came to the banquet, they were given wedding clothes. I guess that's a little different the way they did weddings back in Jesus' day. I think uh, parents would go broke when uh, their children would be married. If you had to buy clothes for everybody that would come to the banquet. But... It is true that in heaven, every one of us is going to have a garment, a wedding garment to wear. And what is that? It is the righteousness and the holiness of Christ. His robe of righteousness that has been placed on us because he died and because he rose from the dead. Now, we remember or some of you do, and about uh, when you bring your children to be baptized. Almost everyone that's been baptized since I've been here has come with a white garment, white clothes. Why is that? Why do great-grandmas pass down to grandma, down to mothers, their baptismal gown that is white? Because it's white garment emphasizes that robe, that garment of Christ's righteousness won for you because of Jesus. We have a funeral pall here at the church that's been used uh, not very often, but has been used, and it's white. And it is white because it represents the garment, not only from baptism all the way to their death, that they have been clothed because of the good news of Jesus by the working of the Spirit of God, that they have that robe of righteousness. And clothed with Christ's righteousness is your entrance to heaven. Now Jesus wasn't a very politically correct person in his day, he had the audacity to say in, uh, in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. Well, that's pretty different than being politically correct. There's salvation given in no other name except that of Jesus and him alone. 
And you see, you and I, because of the good news that has been preached to us, have faith in Jesus. And with that, there is no fear of going to heaven on the last day, or any day. The Lord could take you now. But since you have been clothed with Christ's righteousness, you're ready for the banquet. John tells us in the book of Revelation, there before me there's a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes. Now there was one individual nearing the end of the parable that somehow got into the wedding banquet without a wedding garment. Now we're not told how that happened. How did he get in there? After all, he had to come through the doors. The attendants must have been there to have the garment for them, but he refused the garment. In other words, he refused Christ. Matter of fact, the king goes up to him and says, Hey, fella. The the Greek really goes fella. It's not friend. But in our text, in the ESV, they use the word friend. But fellow, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. (laughs) What could he say? He couldn't even come up with an excuse. Because he had no faith in Christ. There was no a robe of righteousness for him. The king says, take his hands and his feet, bind him, and throw him out. Cast him out into the darkness. In other words, to eternal damnation. Boy, that's pretty harsh. But no faith in Christ, no robe of righteousness, no salvation. So in this parable, you have a plea from Jesus. First to his own people, the Jews. And it's still that way. The gospel still is preached first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Notice that you and I are the Gentiles. We are people, the rest of the people in the world. He has a plea for us to trust him, to confess him, that he is our Messiah, that he is our Lord, and that he is our Savior. And that only from him are we going to receive the joy, the blessed joy, the wonderful joy of eternal life. We hear this morning, everything is now ready. Come to the wedding banquet. I pray that we all see one another at that banquet because of God's love for us in Christ. In his name, alone. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through faith unto Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Please take a moment and sign the worship card in your pew, identifying your attendance at this divine service. And let us gather our offering that the Lord's work may be done here to the glory of his name and for the extending of his kingdom.
We turn to the prayer of the church on page 7 of our bulletin. Let us pray to God Almighty for the church here and around the world and for all people in their various needs. Heavenly Father, through Isaiah, your prophet, you promised an end to tears, suffering, and death itself when we join you around your eternal feast. Hear us as we pray for people who are suffering this day, those displaced because of famine or war, those who are suffering under oppressive regimes, and those who have been discriminated against, unjustly punished, or forgotten by the greater society. Give them just governments and compassionate rulers. May their hope in you be strong until they find relief. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus, healer of our every ill, turn a gracious ear as we pray for people near and dear to us, those facing sudden crises, those enduring long-term illnesses, those mourning the loss of loved ones, those in conflict of any sort, and those concerned about making ends meet. We pray today, we pray today for Bert Weber, John Loman, Sandy Stemke, and uh, Todd Lancaster, who are all dealing with cancer. And also we pray for Luke Ryman, especially as he is in need of our prayers. Give them relief, health, and comfort as fits your gracious plans for them. Lord, in your mercy. And O Holy Spirit, who moved Paul to write about his finding contentment in all circumstances, interpret the sighs of those whose faith is not as firm as his, those who have not truly heard the good news of salvation and those whose attention is focused on worldly fears and concerns. Surround them with caring brothers and sisters of Christ to bring a ministry of word and sacrament to nourish their hearts and minds. Use the talents you have placed within us to be your instruments to restore hope and joy as we look together to the heavenly banquet. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, Heavenly Father, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated, and I would invite the children forward this morning for our children's message. Morning, kids. How was Sunday school? Good. Did you learn about Jesus today? Good. Well, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our gospel lesson, about uh, people. Now, I brought with me... What's this? Have you ever played with a rubber band? Yeah, well... If I have a rubber band, is this what a rubber band is supposed to do, just kind of dangle? What's going on? Is the rubber band doing anything? No, it just, it just you know, there it is. Not really doing anything for the purpose it was, it was made. Now, what happens if I take the rubber band and I go like this and I stretch it? What you think could happen? Could it break? Yeah, it could break. Or it might zoom off. It might fly away and then fall to the ground. Now, this, 
Yeah, well, it can fly. Now, we're going to fly it at the end. Now, this little the rubber band, see? This, this rubber band represents people in our Bible lesson that really just like to go and let things go and that has, they have no purpose in life. No purpose. They don't have Jesus. Now, when we stretch this, we look forward someday to be with Jesus in heaven. Isn't that cool? All right. Now, what's going to happen? We look forward someday to go to heaven. How high do you think this is going to fly? Huh? It's going to go high. I don't know how high, but as this flies up in the sky, we look forward to the day God will take us to heaven. You want to see it go? Where'd it go? Ooh, you guys got good eyes. Can I have it back? Thank you. I don't want you guys shooting one another. Okay? I want you to fold your hands and I want you to pray with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for your love. Help me to live with you in love. In Jesus' name, amen. Go join your parents. See ya. Let us rise for the benediction. May the peace of God which transcends all understanding guard your hearts and minds.
Let's go Cubs. Have a good afternoon. Enjoy the week that God has given to you and uh, treasure in your heart the great banquet someday that you and I will enjoy in heaven. We greet one another with the peace of Christ.